Hi everyone, many of you have already seen the article on my blog about a recent study by anthropologist Rebecca Gibson on how corsets formed the rib cage and part of the spine in Victorian women, and also how this compares with their lifespan. If you didn't see this article, then I'll link it on this screen here, or I'll put it in the cards if you're on mobile. In this video, I'm going to summarize what the recent publication found and how this relates to modern waist training. And if you want to read my email exchange with Rebecca Gibson, clarifying some of the parts of the study, then check out my blog. The study was published in Nexus, the Canadian Student Journal of Anthropology, and it was called The Effects of Long-Term Corseting on the Female Skeleton, a Preliminary Morphological Examination. Gibson wanted to look at women's skeletons from England and France who had lived between the years 1700 and 1900 that showed permanent deformation from wearing a corset, and she wanted to compare this to age markers to determine what age these women were when they had died. Another important part of this study is that the skeletons from the England collection were from a cemetery that was associated with lower class or lower income citizens, like country folk, prostitutes, and prisoners and inmates. There are a lot of stories about the elite class women who were able to purchase the newest and greatest corsets of the time, and they were able to have them fitted to their bodies properly, and they had the privilege of choosing to tight lace. But there's not a lot of evidence of how impoverished women were affected by corsetry. And yes, I did deliberately say the privilege to choose to tight lace, because not every woman tight laced at the time, and not every woman had the means of doing so even if they had wanted to. Nora Waugh's Corsets and Crinolines, which I had reviewed in this channel before, shows primary sources of newspaper columns and other publications from the 19th century, where men wrote publicly and extensively about their distaste for the corset. The practice of tight lacing was largely a popular idea among some women, and men sort of collectively shook their heads at. It was not a case of husbands forcing their wives to tight lace. So why were only some women able to tight lace while others wouldn't? Well, Gibson says that just as people today don't necessarily keep up with the latest fashion, we don't necessarily wear clothes that fit properly, and we don't necessarily purchase our clothes brand new, so a Victorian woman from a lower income family may have worn an older corset passed down to them or purchased second hand, and it may not have fit them perfectly and they might have simply, you know, altered it and made do. But this could mean a lot of things, like wearing a larger or smaller corset that is made for their body, or a taller corset than they can accommodate, perhaps cutting into the armpits, or perhaps uh, children's stays might have been continue being worn by an adolescent girl who has you know, already started growing out of it. Also, from studying antique corsets and measuring them, Gibson calculated that the average corseted waist was about 22 inches in the 1800s. So what did Gibson's research actually find? Well, she found that in these two collections of skeletons from England and France, there was evidence that the ribcage was formed from its normally broad, flared, and oval shape into a more uniformly circular shape. In many of the specimens she studied, the side-to-side -side diameter of the ribcage was identical to the uh, diameter from front to back. So it really was a circle. She noticed an increased amount of curve to the ribs themselves, which is inconsistent with rib cage shaping found in rickets alone. People who have rickets but don't tend to wear corsets, they tend to have flattened ribs but deep bends at the cartilage joints, especially here at the sternum, causing a pigeon chest. And if the rickets were really bad, then even the pressure from the person's own arms at the sides would indent the rib cage at either side. But Gibson's evidence showed that corset wear didn't necessarily cause pigeon chest, and the bones themselves were rounded, not only the sternum and the other cartilage parts, and that most of the bend actually came from the back of the rib here, not indentations at the side that would be seen in rickets. I asked Gibson about the breakages that she had observed in some of the ribs of some specimens, and I asked her if this could be caused by a corset, because I recalled reading in another study where the pressure needed to break a health the human rib exceeded the tension that cotton would rip, which means that a corset is more likely to bust a seam or to actually rip the cotton as opposed to the person breaking the rib. And obviously there would be pain associated, so you would probably be encouraged to take the corset off before the breakage actually occurs. But Gibson said that there was no way of knowing what had caused these breaks that had later healed over. It could have been an occupational hazard because these would have been working class women. It could have been domestic violence. It could have been accidents like falling down. Remember that some of the uh, people buried in this cemetery were prostitutes. So, you know, it can't really be known. For this reason, Gibson focused on the plastic deformation of the ribs instead, showing that at some point, while the bones were still soft and malleable, there were signs of consistent, round, and uniform pressure, causing the bones to bend over time. Another detail she found was that the spinous processes in the thoracic spine, which is the upper back here, 
had angled themselves downward and in some cases overlapped or bent to the side. For those who aren't familiar with the term, spinous processes are like small spikes sticking out of your spine. And when you bend over and feel the bumps on your spine, these processes are what you're feeling. These processes don't house the spinal cord, but instead they provide scaffolding for your back muscles and ligaments to attach to. So what Rebecca found was that these spikes, these processes, were not broken, but they were actually plastically bent downward over time, to the point where they had actually overlapped, almost like scales. And she showed that by stacking these vertebrae together, matching the articulation points of each vertebra, she showed how the spinous processes almost looked like snaggle teeth, you know, they were sort of bent from side to side. And I have to admit that this just completely blew my mind. So I emailed Rebecca and about, you know, why a corset, even an overbust corset, would affect the spine in the upper back. Because she showed that T3 and T4 of the spine around here would be affected. And this is way above the breast tissue, you know, it, it, it's probably around shoulder height, uh, certainly above where the shoulder blades end. So in the 1800s, where these skeletons were from, normally it would be a dummy bust that would be, you know, more in fashion at the time. So it would only come up to about there. I also asked about the way that the vertebrae were stacked, because I noticed that the vertebral column in the photo was very, very straight, whereas it's normal and arguably healthy for a person's spine to have an ever so slight kyphotic curve in the thoracic region, so it's bending slightly like that. I also read on a different website that in some individuals today, it's still normal to see some slight overlapping of the spinous processes in the thoracic region because they all uh, slightly point downward to begin with. Not a ton, but you know, at least a little bit. And this is why you know, back bends and back folds are easier to do from the lumbar region as opposed to the thoracic upper part of the spine. And one of the last things I noticed was that the spaces between each vertebra were very small, smaller than what we would normally see in a person who would presumably have, you know, healthy spinal discs. When I spoke with my chiropractor, he said that it wouldn't be unusual to see less spinal compression in somebody who wore a corset or a back brace because of that extra support. He also said that the curve of the spine is affected by the soft tissues, like the discs, the ligaments, and the muscles surrounding the spine. The angle isn't actually built into the vertebrae themselves, so we can't confirm what sort of posture this person had, whether it was straight or kyphotic, since all the soft tissue had decomposed. But of course, we can't assume that this woman who lived so long ago had healthy, fleshy, intervertebral discs, nor can we assume that this person was wearing a corset that fit them properly. Rebecca told me that she matched articulation points of the vertebrae, which means that the vertebrae were sliding over one another at a certain angle, so there was a little bit of a wear point. So she said what we're seeing is extreme downward spinal compression and a possible straightening out of the upper spine. Both Rebecca Gibson and my chiropractor agree that any bend in these spinous processes would not be likely simply from a change in posture, but it would have to receive consistent pressure over time, which to me thickens the plot a bit, because what corset from the 1800s has a solid back, probably a closed back, to put the right kind of pressure on this upper back area here, and also push down on the back to compress the spine downwards, possibly something with shoulder straps, and you know, maybe uh, one of the adolescent girls had worn a children's corset with straps um, long after she had properly grown out of it so that it was pulling down on her shoulders. We don't really know. I'm just speculating. But anyways, what does all of this mean? What did it mean for the lifespan of these women who uh, you know, actually showed the permanent deformity of their skeletons? First, Gibson looked up the life expectancy of people between the dates of 1700 and 1900. In France, the life expectancy was between 25 and 49 years, while in England, the life expectancy was between 35 and 50 years. Although, you know, it wasn't uncommon for somebody to live long enough to see 60. So after studying the skeletons for certain age markers like osteoarthritis, how fused the plates in the skull were when they taught um, joint fusion diseases like ankylosing spondylitis and jawbone erosion, Rebecca determined that of the skeletons that showed corset wear, a few of them died between the ages of 13 and 45, but many of them were estimated to have lived older than 46 years old, and one of them did live uh, longer than 60, it's estimated. So all of her subjects had either reached or exceeded their life expectancy at the time. We might not know all the details about the quality of life from these corseted women that came from a lower class burial site, but what we do know is that their lifespan was on the average to long side comparatively. But what does this mean for modern tight lacers and waist trainers today? Could we see the same level of deformity in a modern skeleton? 
Well, I've had plenty of x-rays myself, especially after my car accident last year, so I know that my skeleton looks completely normal. Even though I wear very conical rib corsets sometimes, this one isn't the most conical I have, um, I know that these are mostly the joints in my rib cage that are temporarily bending and swinging in and out to accommodate the shape of the, the corset, but that the shape of my bones, the, the ribs themselves, are not becoming more curved over time. We know that 200 years ago, adolescent girls started wearing stays when they were still growing, and their skeletons were still cartilaginous and soft. Vitamin D deficiencies were not really uncommon at the time w among all the different classes due to malnutrition in the lower class and from women staying out of the sun and you know covering their bodies in the upper class so that their skin would remain fair. This means that their bones not only started out softer, but they could have remained softer and more malleable than ours even growing into adulthood. Also, the silhouette of corsets have changed as well. A tapered rib cage was very popular in the 1800s, and a very conical torso was fashionable in the 1700s, whereas the new look waspies from the 1940s and 50s showed a relatively free rib cage and a dramatically nipped in waistline right under the ribs. Today, a more cupped rib cage is becoming more popular, and many different brands are starting to make corsets that constrict only the waist and not so much the ribs. Likewise, demi-bust and overbust corsets were commonly worn during the Victorian era, whereas more often than not, we pair an underbust corset today with a modern bra, with a stretchy, flexible band going around the back of the upper rib cage. So the corsets are not coming out quite so high to press on the upper thoracic vertebrae. And even though I'm wearing a bit of a high back corset today, you can see that it's quite flexible and not putting any pressure on my spine right there. We also have a more extensive knowledge on what is a healthy, neutral posture today. We know that spines are not ramrod straight, but they have curves to them, and we can draft courses to accommodate this front-to-back curve instead of forcing it out of its natural alignment. So I don't personally believe that corsets will necessarily do to a modern person what the antique corsets did to skeletons in the study, based on the way that corsets are shaped and constructed today, our age and nutrition when we choose to start wearing corsets today, and the fact that we aren't wearing them 24-7. Well, you know, some do, but not all of us, but once again, that's a personal choice and I believe that choices should be well educated and you know the person should weigh the different factors but it is interesting to know at least that those women whose skeletons were studied had just as long of a lifespan as anyone else at the time so what do you think of Rebecca Gibson's study let me know in a comment down below I'll link my blog the original study in Nexus Rebecca's Facebook page and some other reading materials in the description below and if you like this video, remember to click that like button down there and help support the channel. Share this video if you found it interesting. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!